Hey, good morning and welcome to Breakthrough Walls. I am Ken Walls and I'm your host and I have a new friend and a very special guest on today. She was introduced to me by another friend, Joe Skelly over in Philadelphia. And I want to welcome my new friend, Jen Groover to the show. Jen, welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. You know, my, my, my brain wants to say Grover and I don't know why. I don't, don't do that. That's like trauma <laughs> from my childhood. <laughs> Is it really? <laughs> totally. I mean, I, I ran track all through my childhood and you'd be at these big fields and there'd be a big megaphone and <laughs> Every time, instead of Jen Gruber, they'd call my name and it'd be Jen Gruber. And, oh, and of no. course, to kids, that's hilarious. <laughs> so it is literally, I post-traumatic stress from it. So just remember, <laughs> <laughs> this is how I introduce myself to people now so they don't forget is it's Gruber, like groovy with an R. <laughs> 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 it's well, I you know, I've met Tim Grover. So. <laughs> it is not a gift for a child to have your last name Grover. That is oh, that's <laughs> terrible. I'm sorry. Well, I'll never think that again. Well, I probably will, but I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> no, always no. remember it's traumatic for you. <laughs> <laughs> groovy, just remember groovy, groovy, groovy. So, so Jen, um, you and I had a great conversation on the phone. And, um, you know, I told you, I started this show to help people break through the things that are holding them back in life. Um, and I know you have a lot of experience helping people do that. So this should be exciting. Um, let's start with where you were born and raised. Uh, yeah. and by the way, you're going to have full screen. So. Okay, great. I remember yeah. in my kitchen for coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I was born in uh, Philadelphia, right outside of Philadelphia, in uh, this place called Media. And um, my, I was born to a father who grew up um, poor, right in Chester, PA. And uh, my mother was from Brooklyn, New York. And um, and it was an interesting childhood. Uh, my father grew up in a really dysfunctional family, uh, emotionally unavailable family, mm. and um, was working on the docks uh, with uh, guys uh, doing shipping back when he was 13 years of age. Uh, and, you know, he's around all these older men and started drinking. And um, when my mom met him, he was this charismatic guy. Uh, they fell madly in love quickly. And uh, she actually came to Philadelphia for a photo shoot for Seventeen Magazine. And she had really kinky curly hair and they tried to straighten her hair and it all fell out. <laughs> so oh. my, my dad oh. met my mom when she was bald. Um, and, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. So he was an attorney and he was in the DA's office at the time. And um, like, as I mentioned, they fell madly in love and it was this quick whirlwind romance. And um, next thing you know, my mom's married and realized that she fell in love with a highly functioning alcoholic. Mm. Um, so that led to a lot of abuse. Um, my mom um, was a fixer. So um, once she realized this, she wanted to fix it and, and get everything uh. back to what it was in the beginning. And so a lot of my childhood was uh, filled with um, trauma, uh, abuse, and, and all of it um, is what really makes me who I am today. And that's why I think it's an important part of my story because surviving through that as a child, uh, there's a lot of trauma and trauma is relative to everybody. Everybody has trauma to some degree. Sure. Um, and again, it's all relative to the eye of the beholder. Uh, but I, as a child, had a lot of survival skills to thrive. Um, I used my imagination to escape my reality, which is probably why I'm an entrepreneur and an inventor, uh, and, and innovate things. Uh, that imagination is powerful. Your creativity is your unlimited capital. Uh, and so when I went to college and I studied psychology, it was the first time in my life I actually was excited about school. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what I was learning. Um, and, uh, you know, school up to that point was escape for me, as it is for many children. It was escape of uh, a, a safer space, um, being around your friends and um, being in a, a place that's distracting. And so um, 
when I went to college and I was learning psychology, it, it finally made sense of everything that I had lived through. Um, realizing my dad was just repeating cycles of his childhood and um, and his parents' cycles and their parents' cycles. And yeah. um, my mom was, um, you know, trying to be strong and fix things and, and make things right. And uh, she had so much power and strength. My mom ran campaigns for politicians. My mom had a TV show. She was this powerful woman outwardly. But the thing psychologically that was always interesting to me is while she was outwardly so powerful in her house, she was completely demeaned and diminished and, and weakened um, and, and living in a state, state of fear constantly. So um, psychology opened my mind to what's possible of changing human behavior, changing patterns. And as I was sitting in my first class, I would just think, why isn't this mandatory for everybody? Like everybody should be learning the study of human behavior. That's the thing we all have in common. Like forget all the silly classes that I had to waste time on. Right. This should be one of the mandatory classes. And, and it makes everyone more successful. The more you understand psychology, the more successful you'll be at everything, not just professionally, but more successful parent, more successful partner, more successful anything of, of human relationship. Right. So, um, so yeah, so that's where the tipping point of, of my future really began um, or took off, I should say, uh, when I started learning psychology and, and I knew that that information was going to really predict how I would live in my future. So, so and by the way, <clears throat> excuse me, I can relate um, to everything you just said. I, I was raised in a very, very similar household. And, um, you know, I, I think that, and, and it's interesting because I became very interested in human behavior and psychology. I think <laughs> when you're, when you're in that environment, like it, it's almost automatic, right? You want to figure it out. Figure yeah. Yeah. You're trying to figure yourself out, you know? And so, so, but during school, like growing up as a kid, did you find yourself living in a lot of fear too? Um, you know, I think I did. Um, I look back at my kindergarten picture and I had fever blister on my face. Right. And, and that is at five years of age, that is stress. Right. Yeah. So, so I realized how stressed I was, um, in my second grade picture, I had one like each year I had one. Um, and so it makes me realize how much more stressed I was than I even probably realized. Um, right. I really used outdoor play as escapism. Um, I was an adventurous child, so I always want to be outdoors and, and feeling free. And that was how I felt safe, I guess. And um, and so, you know, I just, I think that it, I, it's interesting. I have a brother that's only 11 months older than me, and we were very, very different. And, and our viewpoint of how we survived during that time is very different. And, and it's fascinating from a psychological standpoint how his life is so different than mine because he was more of the victim to the circumstance where I had these innate survival skills to still thrive during the time. And then once I found psychology, I, I understood I can now control my future. I can now control my thought process. I can control how I view what happened to, yeah. to then course correct the future. And, and it's funny you said psychology and, and becoming interested in human behavior. I always joke in, in my keynotes, that I started studying psychology and I quickly found that everybody else in my class or uh, many people in my classes had really dysfunctional childhoods too. And they were there just trying to figure it out, like make yeah. sense of the craziness. Yeah. I, I mean, that that's, uh, I'm sure you've read all of Tony Robbins books. <laughs> you know, you're like, I mean, cause back, I'm back when I was, I remember reading awaken the giant within and I thought, yeah. Oh my God, this is, this is me. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so you went to college, you studied psychology, you got a degree in psychology. Yeah. Did you, did you go on any further than bachelor's or? Yeah. So, um, I continued education. So when I was in college, I, um, went home during a, a holiday break and, uh, was introduced, I'm about to age myself completely, but was introduced <laughs> to step aerobics. And having been an athlete my whole life, I did sports 
uh, track, as I mentioned, uh, basketball and soccer. So working out and conditioning for those sports literally usually makes you want to vomit. You know, it's wind sprints, it's plyometrics. So when I did summer aerobics, I was like, this is amazing. I'm working out. I feel great. I'm paying attention to choreography. So my, my mind is working yeah. and, um, and, and, and the music gets my energy up. So I wanted to bring that back to school. So I went to the administrators at my university and um, I said, I need a space, a hundred steps and a boom box. So that's where my <laughs> entrepreneurship actually began. I didn't realize it then, but uh, thinking. Uh, uh, what's a boom box? <laughs> I the story ages my me um, <laughs> with a cassette player, and I forgot oh, wow. <laughs> a microphone, which is why my voice is forever raspy now. <laughs> I was in this gym with the worst acoustics in the world, screaming over hundred people stepping on steps. Oh so, my gosh. But it was a high. It was such a high for me. Uh, so back then is when I started. Uh, doing all of my personal training certifications and doing continued education in uh, nutrition and physiology. So after college, I continued taking more courses uh, in, in certifications in nutrition and physiology. Uh, and then um, I was a national level fitness competitor working with Reebok on the aerobics performance team. I owned a gym in Wilmington, Delaware, right out of college. And um, I would uh, be at all these events. And you, you mentioned Tony. At all these events were Tony and a lot of the other thought leaders uh, teaching mindset training and yeah. having this obsession with my uh, background in psychology. I would sit in awe of learning how to take all this psychology and apply it to how do you thrive in life. So psychology in itself is just the analysis, right? And it's the picking apart and the understanding. But 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 there's another component to it. A lot of people don't realize, and the and the difference between traditional psychology and the analysis is then once you're aware of where you are, how do you take that knowledge and move forward? And that's the component a lot of people miss is, right. all right, I know what my childhood was, but if I keep staring at that, I'm stuck. So how do I make sense of it? How do I change the story if the story is holding me back? How do I find the story's lessons, the resiliency, the adaptability, the agility, all the benefits that came from it to move forward? and. So uh, some of the greatest thought leaders were at all of these events and I started being exposed to uh, quantum physics and neuroscience and metaphysics. Mm. And, and that's where my, I've been a, a continued lifelong learner. I read books constantly. I watch videos literally every day of my life. First hour of my day is about my own personal growth. So I'm always in growth mode and growth, what a lot of people don't understand makes you happy. So. I'm growing because I constantly want to bring value to my clients and my speaking engagements and my content. But even if you're not doing that for professional reasons, to grow every day, to learn something new every day is what really truly ignites happiness in us. I love that. So you have to be a fan of Dr. Joe Dispenza. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, I love Joe. I, uh, I really love Joe. Um, he's, he's amazing. I love that guy. Yeah, my daughter um, got Lyme disease when she was six. We didn't know for one year. So oh, wow. when you don't know for one year, especially in a little child who's developing, uh, it can cause some really long-term damage. Uh, so after a year when we found out, we followed the protocol from the physician, which was 28 days of, of doxycycline. I didn't realize then she probably should have been having IV level of doxycycline since it had gone so long undetected and, and the spirochete were multiplying in her body. So um, basically she's had some lifelong struggles since she was sick. She's now 16. So the last 10 years, uh, it kind of goes in and out of remission. But this past year, it caused this significant brain damage, uh, and which caused significant gut damage and autoimmune issues. So Oh. Her body's healing. Um, she has a lot of uh, psychological, psychological, and psychosomatic issues attached to that, to the mm. trauma that she's had. Uh, and as her mother, it's annoying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to try and lecture her and teach her. So um, I'm actually going to take her to one of Dr. Joe's um, conferences, uh, the 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 five day long conference, so that wow. um. 
once once her body's healed a little bit further so that she can work through the psychosomatic part of it because the psychosomatic part will always bring her back regardless of how much her physiological state is improving that psychological component if not changed will always bring her back to to the less than ideal place wow Wow. And I mean, I hear, well, so do you. I mean, we hear about these amazing things that occur at his, his events, oh, yeah, like yeah. major healings. And mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible. I, I becoming supernatural or uh, supernatural, mm -hmm. right? Becoming yep. supernatural, unbelievable book. Um, I wish everyone would read it so they can understand, especially now as we're going through this time where everyone feels so powerless. Yeah. If you actually understood the physiology around that, the neuroscience around that, the ability of our bodies to uh, heal, the ability of our minds to control what our physiological state is, is yeah. doing. A lot of people wouldn't be in so much fear right now and understand that they have so much more power than they even realized. Well, and I think, you know, that that's one of the things when when I started looking at everything you've done and <clears throat> I'm like, wow, this chick's done some cool stuff. <laughs> so ADD. Um, what's that? It's how I control my ADD. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done some really cool stuff, which we're going to get into. But so you went to college, you 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 come out of college. What was your first did you get a job? Did you did you start your own business? What what happened? The answer is both, and I'll tell you how that <laughs> happened. <laughs> so, um, my degree was in psychology and education, and my dad had this belief that when you get a degree in something, you have to do that thing for the rest of your life, which yeah. was never my plan at all. Uh, I knew psychology was going to help my future. I knew the education was going to help my future, but I didn't know exactly how that was going to look. And so I basically succumbed to my dad's pressure and uh, took over for a teacher in kindergarten for half of the school year. And during that time period, I affirmed for myself that was exactly what I did not want to do for the rest of my life. And God bless, <laughs> God bless the people that had the patience to do it because it wasn't me. And uh, and and I later had twins, so I guess when you pray for something more, you get it. <laughs> oh wow! How else do you learn patience than go from zero children to two at one time? So. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I did that for um, half of the school year. And um, after that, I said to my dad, I cannot do this for the rest of my life. Like there is not a chance in this world. I feel sick to my stomach going to school every day. And wow. um, during that time period, I was still teaching aerobics all over the area. I was getting more master class trainings. Uh, I was teaching master classes. I was getting more and more certifications, becoming more um, viable and more um, – capable of, it, of really expanding my wings in the fitness arena, which was a new industry back then. If you really think about it, this is 1995. Yeah. Um, and so I then said to my dad, I'm going all in, in the fitness industry. And so he then was like, how on earth will you be making money? <laughs> my dad was very traditional. Like you're, you, you, there was just professional categories for him. And those were the things that you had to do. And if you didn't do those things, you were probably going to live impoverished for the rest of your life. And, yeah. and, and this is, you were a kindergarten teacher. Correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, then I said to my dad, this is what I'm doing. And I was bartending at night at that time too, to make extra money. And Shortly after that conversation with my father, while I was bartending, I ran into some guy that I went to high school with. Well, actually, like a neighboring high school. And uh, he said, hey, Groover, I heard that you're doing a lot in the fitness industry right now. We're looking for uh, a female to, to become a partner with us to bring group fitness program to our gym and to you know really attract female clients because it's two guys right now. And... Um, you know, what do you think? And I was like, I'm in, I don't know exactly how to run this business, but I know how to create a group fitness program and I know how to train people and I know how to connect with people. And he's like, well, none of us actually really know what we're doing right now. So let's all just figure it out together. So, uh, that's what happened. And that's what happens with most entrepreneurs. You don't really know what you're doing until you're doing it. And, uh, that's 
where the, the pivot happened for me uh, to go down a completely different path than a traditional path that uh, seemed typical and, and traditional in the way that my dad wanted it to be. And, you know, my dad actually programmed my thought process of entrepreneurship without even realizing it because uh, I always thought it was absolutely insane, absolutely insane that I would go work for somebody and work a thousand percent because anything that I was going to do is a thousand percent and somebody else controlled how quickly I could grow. That was so bizarre to me. Even at 18, 19, 20 years of age, I couldn't wow. really wrap my head around why someone would do that. And so um, my dad he was, as, as I mentioned, he was an attorney. So he would say to people all the time when they'd say, why aren't you working for a big firm? He'd say, I want to come and go as I please. I don't want to answer to anybody. And I never want to work on Fridays. And I, I would always be like, wow, that sounds great. Like, <laughs> yeah. what I want to do. Right. I want to go as I please. I don't want to answer to anybody. And I don't want to work on Fridays. So that I think really kind of made me think, well, I'm just going to do my own thing and answer to myself and, you know, maybe some business partners. But uh, that really dictated my thought process on entrepreneurship because back in 1995, being an entrepreneur wasn't the cool thing the way it is now. Now it's a, it's a thing. Uh, then I don't even know that the word was ever used. No. I mean, was. we didn't say I'm an entrepreneur. No, I, I agree. Right. We People would literally be like, um, why are you doing this? Can you not get hired? Like, why, why would you do this? <laughs> my friends all work for pharmaceutical companies. They have yeah. expense accounts and cars and stuff. I know. <laughs> living paid and paycheck. <laughs> you're living on top ramen trying to figure out how to... Like a, a, a company car and a, and a gas card sounds good about right now. Oh, yeah. I know. They would be like, why don't you just come work for us? And I'd think about it. And I'd be like, no, I can't do that. I cannot. I feel like I'm selling my soul. No, I can't do it. Right, right. I can so relate to that. Oh, my gosh. So, so you, um, you, you, so here you are, 1995. You're starting down, really starting down the entrepreneurial path. Mm -hmm. What, where did, where did things go from there with the gym and, and all of that? And was it a, was it a regular, like a, a standard type gym, like weights and. Yeah, so it was, but it was more, um, it was almost like a country club gym. So okay. all of our clients, um, which was a huge part of who I became to all of our clients were incredibly successful. Uh, one of them was the founder of MBNA. Um, and, and so it was, it was private. It was all personal training except for the group fitness. So you couldn't just come in and work out whenever you want to work out. You had to be with a personal trainer. Back then we were charging, uh, I think it was 65, $75 an hour, uh, which was a lot back then. Sure. Um, and, and people couldn't even do that unless they were buying packages of 20 at a time. Uh, so it was definitely catering to a, a higher end clientele. Um, which was amazing and definitely shaping my future because all of these clients were so successful and so well-rounded and uh, would teach me. As I'm teaching them and training them, I'm learning from them at the same time. I'm living life through their lens and where they would travel and the things that they would do. And it really helps me aspire to have a lifestyle like that, to uh, desire to live the way that they intentionally created for themselves. Yeah. So while they were learning from me, I was learning from them. Um, and, and during that time, I was also traveling all over, uh, you know, in this fitness movement to all these conventions and uh, as a national level fitness competitor. So um, during that same time period, I continued to study and evolve. And also back then, life coaching was a, a new thing. Um, so I actually got certified as a life coach as well. So having that background in psychology was only natural. And then I started working with a lot of my clients, not just on the physical fitness side, but a lot of them were women that wanted to start businesses and had no idea how to. So I would always, one of my gifts is, is helping people identify their gifts, um, really drawing out their greatness and magnifying it for them and um, helping them package that. So um, 
I would do that just naturally for my, my clients. We'd be working out together, but I'd be extracting for them their future dreams yeah. and, and how they would get those. So, um, so I helped a lot of these women start their own businesses and uh, many of them onto QVC. Uh, and then I actually became a spokesperson for brands on QVC, which was huge for me because I had an extreme fear of being on television. Yeah. Uh, I had to get over that fear. Um, when I was a kid, my mom had a TV show and um, a, a political current affairs show. Yeah. Oh, she would make me be the kid commentator. So I'd ask kids about current affair topics. And kids at school got wind of this, saw it on TV, and of course, you know, kids do in, in grade school. Uh, so they'd make fun of me. So, I mean, that's what kids do. Really? Oh, yeah. Do you, anything they could pick apart, your hair, your clothes, you name it. So um, I, wow. I, it made me literally, like, move back out of the light into the shadow for years, many years. Um, I would minimize who I was because of that for fear of ridicule, fear of rejection, fear of being made fun of. So with the QVC opportunity, when it came up, it came up a lot of times and I had turned it down. And um, I finally realized if I don't face this fear, I will never become what I'm meant to be. I will never have a bigger megaphone or a bigger platform. I will never be able to spread my desire to inspire people if I minimize myself. Yeah. And so I had to face that fear. And the first time I was going on, I'm telling you, I was sick for weeks. I'm like, why did I do this to myself? <laughs> going, going through all those childhood wounds of, oh my gosh, what about what am I going to wear and my hair? And what if people see it? Like, I want people to see it, but I don't want people to see it. Uh, it was really a crazy time. And the, the miracle of it was when I went on air, that first time. Now, QVC, for those of you who don't know, you have to sell five thousand dollars a minute back then. It's probably sort of five thousand like dollars a minute. Five thousand dollars a minute. Okay, so there's a lot of pressure. Uh, wow. And, yes, I know. It's it. I say I got my master's in business at QVC because you have to go through training, and you have to learn all that. It's all psychology, by the way. You have to learn all the psychology, how to sell. How to you know speak in certain ways where you always pose the problem first and the solution later, but then it's not just TV where it's like one camera in front of you or maybe two other cameras. There's multiple cameras, three to five cameras depending on what the setup is, and then there's multiple TV screens in front of you. So you're watching what's happening before, what's happening in the present, what's happening in the past, and there's cameras coming down around you from above. Because if you, for me, if I'm doing a demo. They've got a demo from above. So it's just like crazy town if you're not conditioned for it. And so it was overwhelming. But the high, the high that I got when I got off air, I was like shaking, the adrenaline's going. And I'm like, when can I come back? <laughs> oh, my God. Are you kidding me? So, so, so. Like you're selling Dyson vacuum cleaners and <laughs> back then it was fitness and fashion for me. Um, but yeah, it was fitness and wow. fashion products. Uh, and, yeah. and it was just, it was crazy. It was overwhelming, but it was magical because I realized if I could do that from a television standpoint, I could do anything in that space because, and it's funny because after that, after I launched my Butler bag company, uh, I really was working a lot with different networks and producers would be like, oh, you've been on QVC, you're fine. You can do anything. <laughs> because yeah. I understood the training and the rigor, rigorous pressure that happens when everything's there's no, There's no editing, is there? QVC oh, no, is live. Are, are. Yeah. Yeah, if you mess up, the world's watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is, and did you? <laughs> Um, you know, I don't think I ever really did. Um, yeah. and I, I'm pretty sure I would remember it if I did, but yeah. um, you always, I'm, I'm a really tough critic on myself. Yeah. So I'd always rewatch it and, and rewatch and pick apart and, and really try to in, improve. It's like watching, it's like football players watching the playbacks yeah. Monday and Tuesday after playing a game and, and watching how could I have done this better in, in QVC, um, after you're done, 
they have this machine in the green room that you can actually look at uh, where you can really tell what you said and and how you were saying it and how you were demonstrating if it was helping you or hurting you, if it was driving sales or you were losing sales. Uh, so you can pretty much see what's working for you and what's not working for you. So you can keep crafting to be better and better and better. But I would definitely, every time I go backstage, I would rewatch and I'd pick apart, not um, go in and be like, yeah, that was amazing. I would always figure out how I could do better. Now, how do they... Uh, uh and maybe you're not allowed to talk about this, but do, do the on air personalities like, do you get commissions? <laughs> so the on air personalities get paid uh, a fee to be there. Okay. Um, and some companies do give commission to sales. Do they really? Yeah, some wow. do. Not all, but some right. do. Uh, it's wow. usually somebody who has been with the company for a long time or somebody who, um, maybe invested in the company. So there's got to be a little bit more vested interest. Yeah. yeah. But most of the uh, on-air spokespeople get paid to be there. Wow. Wow. That That's baptism by fire. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, welcome to TV. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if I was going to face my fear, I might as well just go all in and face it. <laughs> the right. Most intense way possible. Uh, but it was, it was definitely a great experience that I feel very much shaped my future. It's what inspired me to want to keep inventing um, products and, and build businesses. And I'd be around all of these incredible people that were making millions and millions of dollars on their widgets. And, and I would meet them and I talk to them and I'd be like, they're just like me. Why are they doing this and I'm not doing this? I have ideas too. And, and I realized something that really also was another tipping point in my life. Um, in mindset training, there's a process that uh, helps you evaluate where you are to where you want to go. So any outcome we have in our lives right now that we don't like, there's beliefs that are attached to them that have to change in order for your outcomes to change. And that's why most people go through life never changing their outcomes. They might be working harder, making more effort, but the outcome's still not budging the way they want it to budge just because there's belief systems that are limiting them from actually ac assessing or accessing their potential to, to go to the next level. So in mindset training, when you hit this moment of frustration, like why are they doing it and I'm not doing it? Or why is this outcome keep happening? I don't want this outcome to keep happening. I wanna get to the next level of where I wanna go. It's this moment of truth where you have to stop and evaluate why is this happening? What are the beliefs that are attached to this outcome that are holding me back? And so for me, at this time period, I was I realized that my fear of failure was what was holding me back from not getting to the next level. So that question of why are they doing it? I'm not. I had an idea journal this big filled with ideas and, and I'd have to keep checking to myself what is holding me back? Why am I not taking more action? While it seems like I'm doing cool things to a lot of people, I'm still not living to my potential. And um, and so I realized this fear of failure was holding me back. So now I've identified what it is. The next thing in the step in this process is you have to figure out where it came from and then you flip the belief. So I identified that this belief was not programmed by me. It was programmed in my childhood from my dad who is a drill sergeant in the Marines. Mm -hmm. and, and the belief is failure is not an option, which I totally understand on a battlefield and, and in those circumstances. Right. But when you teach a child failure is not an option, a child with good self-preservation skills is yeah. going to do only what they're good at and not what they're gonna fail at for that fear of failure. So that's what I did most of my childhood was did what I was naturally good at and was scared to death to do things that I could fail at because I thought I was a failure. So, um, wow, you know, that's so powerful. Yeah. And, and, you know, can so many people, when I share this story resonate with it and, and really get it because that's, what's holding them back this fear of failure. Yeah. So, when you have, when you identify the belief that's holding you back, you have to flip the belief. And this is part of rewiring your brain. So I had to flip the belief and the belief is that I created was, I have more fear of regret than I have of failure. Because fear still will exist. It keeps us alive in many ways, but yeah. how do you propel, 
how do you use the fear to propel you forward? So for me, it was realizing regret was so much worse than failing. And so I have more fear of regret than I have of failure became my mantra. That's my new hardwiring for my brain. Um, so basically, in neuroscience 101 is your you have uh, neural pathways in your brain. These are messenger systems in your brain. And so your beliefs are attached to these messenger systems. So when I flip the belief and I create the new belief and I create this new mantra, affirmation, I say this new belief over and over again so now I can hardwire my brain to override the old programming. And you have to be consistent at it and, and you have to do it for, for depends on how long you've held the old belief, but sometimes for periods of time, just hundreds of times a day, every day, the new belief to weaken the old neural pathway and strengthen the new one. But so, what, let, let me ask you a question, if I may. Sure. Um, what about when you're trying, like you want something so bad, but, and you're doing those things, which I totally am down with that. I, mm -hmm. I do the affirmations. I write them out. I do, I teach that. But what, what about the people that they don't believe it? Like they do not believe that it's possible, but they still want it. Yeah. Well, if you don't believe it, you're not going to get it. And, and that's really what it comes down to. And, and a lot of times when people um, don't believe it, there's a worth component to that uh, or conditioning component of, you know, no one where I come from does that. Or my parents always told me that that's for other people. So there's, if you don't believe it, there's beliefs that you still need to uncover to get to the place that you can believe it. And sometimes with clients, I have them work in just little baby steps of their beliefs, right? So instead of just going for this, I'm going to create a million dollar company next year, uh, they are, I'm going to create X amount this month, right? So I, I help them take baby steps so that that confidence can be built to help align with the belief. Or, you know, one of the things that I, I teach um, in the more method is what is it that you want more of? Because we're conditioned to create these goals and, and these goals can be big and audacious and probably a lot of times won't believe them if they're big and audacious and we've never taken those steps to really build that muscle of taking leaps in those beliefs. But when, when you ask somebody what they want more of, you get to the truth of what these goals are. So a lot of times we will say more time with my family, more ability to travel, uh, more fulfillment. Right. So I ask them to pay attention to the things they want more of um, and, and then align their daily behaviors with what they want more of, which will then get them closer to their goals. So a lot of times the goals that we have aren't even, aren't even ours. They're what we think will be cool. They're what we think people want to hear from us. They're, they're what we think our parents want from us. So, so I always say, why do you want these goals? What are, what's the value of these goals? And that's where we get to the truth of what do you want more of? And what happens in this process is often what they want more of and what their goals are, are not aligning. And mm. so if you're not aligning the two, you're never going to get that goal because it's not truly what you even want anyway. And, and so that gets you to a closer sense of true self. And, and if you want more time freedom, then maybe building the million dollar business, the way that you think you should be building it, isn't the right strategy at all. And, and maybe, you know, you be, need to be looking at a business model that's more about leverage than time for money. So it's always about getting more to the truth of why we want things first and what we really desire more of in mm. the action to align to the, those goals. Wow. That's so powerful. So powerful. So, so, um, <clears throat> what, so how long did you do the QVC thing? Um, for probably about four years before I, maybe longer before I then invented technology in a handbag, uh, and, and uh and uh, hold it invented what technology in a handbag <laughs> <laughs> and i'm sure you're gonna tell us what that is it's totally normal right <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it, like that like you a handbag with gps built in or no but that would have been good too um <laughs> I invented the first ever uh, compartmentalized handbags. So 
Um, basically, it was inspired by being a new mom of twins, um, feeling completely overwhelmed and completely disheveled every day yeah. of my life. Um, and one night I was at the grocery store with my, my girls in their car seats, those heavy car seats, and I put them down um, on the floor in their car seats, not just on the floor. Yeah. Uh, and I'm in an express line and I'm trying to find my credit card in my bag and I cannot find my credit card. I'm digging through my bag. I'm sweating. My kids begin screaming. Oh, no. Loud screeching in it like a duet. And now I'm like, oh my God, I'm holding up this line. I can't find my credit card. My kids are screaming. And everyone's <laughs> looking at me, obviously. So um, I dump my bag out in front of the cashier and I find my credit card. And in my mind, I'm thinking, seriously, how do we as women accepting a bucket? for a bag, it's literally a bucket. I mean, I could get lining, water, a mop, it's a bucket. <laughs> it's a crazy thing, why are we doing this? And um, my mom had this mantra, programming for my brain, mm -hmm. uh, that you are not allowed to complain about something unless you back it up with a solution. Oh. So, powerful, right? That's, that is. It was so annoying as a child, like beyond annoying. But I'm sure I thank her every day because it taught me to be a solution driven person. And and so often what I find is why innovation is, is stalled and why people are stuck is because they're so focused on the problem and talking about the problem and complaining about the problem and never just thinking about the okay, we see the problem. Now yeah. let's put the energy into the solution. And and so as I'm leaving the store that night, I'm thinking, there's gotta be a better way. I mean, there has to be a better way. And then I'm and then I'm thinking, how could I create a better way? I'm not good at drawing. I can't even draw a stick figure well. Um, I, I'm not an engineer. I I, I, can, I don't know how I'd figure this problem out, but this is a real problem. And um, so I went home, went back about my life. I think about it every once in a while. And then about six months later, I'm unloading my dishwasher and I have the bird's eye view of the knives, forks, and spoons, and the utensil tray. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh. Now, here's the thing. I kind of skipped a little bit of an important part of this that is, is around the mindset training. During this time period is when I realized and changed my thought process. I have more fear of regret than failure. Failure is just part of the process on the journey to success. When we change our, our beliefs, we change our brain, we change our perspective, our viewpoints of the world. I don't know if I would have seen what I was about to see as an opportunity or if I would have seized it as an opportunity if I didn't change how I was viewing the world. So when I looked in that dishwasher, I've been unloading the dishwasher my entire life. Right. I mean, that's like my chore as a child. <laughs> right. I would have never looked at this dishwasher tray as a multi-million dollar opportunity. But oh my God. Time, I did, and I truly believe in all that I know about uh, programming of, of, of our minds and, and how when we shift our beliefs, we shift our views, and we just see things differently. And our perspectives keep changing the more we keep changing our beliefs. So um, in that moment, I thought to myself, well, that's how I want everything in my handbag to be, in compartment, standing up straight. So as any logical human being would do, I took my dishwasher tray out of my dishwasher. <laughs> and took it in my handbag. No, you did not. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, I did. You got to be kidding me. For all the ladies listening, they'll remember this. There was uh, this Kate Spade, very classic bag that existed. Not the original one, but the bigger one that could double as like a handbag and, and a, a diaper bag. Stuck my bag in there. <laughs> and uh, that became my first prototype. <laughs> so oh, my gosh. The next day, I went to show it to a couple of my friends that I trusted. And I was like, guys, look at this. I think this is this this is like something. This is the answer to every woman's problem in their handbag. And um, every one of them said two, two, one of two things, which is called the post-it note theory. They either said, come on, someone's had to have thought of that, or seriously, I wish I thought of that. Yeah. So I, I knew I was on to something. 
And that's where my scavenger hunt to creating this company began, um, which then turned into um, into something pretty significant for, for me taking everything that I learned about mindset training and applying it and proving that it all worked. That is so, uh, that's <laughs> incredible. I love, love, love that story. So you turned that into a multi-million dollar company? I did. Um, wow. I, uh, in the first year of business, now I have no idea, it was interesting. Even though I had worked with a bunch of different companies, at QVC and such, I thought people would be more helpful to me helping figure this out. And yeah. prior to that, I had only had service-based businesses. There's a significant difference in risk between a service-based business and a business where you're creating product and holding inventory. Very different ballgame. Yeah. Uh, scary. It was a lot scarier than the things before. So... Um, during this time period, I learned something uh, that was really interesting to me that really helped me create the goals that I had for the Butler Bag Company. I had learned that women uh, at that time period were creating less than 1% of the wealth in the United States of America. This is 2005. So 2004 is when my girls were born. 2004 is when I was in the grocery store and got this idea. 2005 is now where I'm making this company become a company. 2006 is when it launched. So in 2005, I realized that uh, women are creating less than 1% of the wealth in the United States, which was so bizarre to me because women were starting businesses back then two to one, and women were going to college equally. So I, of course, my psychology mind analyzes everything, and I'm like, that doesn't make sense. What is, why is this happening? What is the psychological phenomenon that's making this happen? And I realized it's beliefs, conditioned beliefs from generations in the past. So it's not a knowledge thing. Women were graduating equally from university. At that point, you know, we had the internet, so we had access yeah. to a lot of information. Right. And now we have no excuse for not having access to the information. But, um, you know, I realized that women were stuck in these patterns of fear around if I'm too successful, I'm not a good mom. If I'm not, if I'm too successful, I'm not a good spouse. If I'm mm -hmm. too successful, my friends want too much from me. And, and that's a big one for women. When they feel like people are going to want too much for it from them, they actually minimize what their potential is because they feel overly responsible for things. Or if I'm too successful, my friends won't like me and they might be jealous. So um, I recognize all of these belief systems, and I also recognize that there weren't enough female role models to break down these barriers and beliefs, kind of like the four-minute mile, right? So mm -hmm. everyone believed that you couldn't run faster than a four-minute mile. A human couldn't run faster than a four-minute mile until right. somebody breaks that, that rule or belief and goal. Then all of a sudden, all these people could run faster than yeah. a four-minute mile. Right. So I kind of use that same psychology of what if I could be part of the solution? What if I could really be an example of that you can be successful and be a good mother and be a good spouse and, and be uh, a good person? And uh, that was my goal is to make this company in the first year of business a million dollar company. And again, that, this is back in 2006, which is pretty much unheard of and, and very few people ever did anything like this at that time, which is why I made the goal so audacious to be really scary. But I, I also made it about other people than just myself, which really is a motivating drive. Right. So, um, we hit uh, $1 in sales in the two weeks shy of the first year. And then the second year, I was like, well, oh, wow, that worked. All those formulas and everything I learned worked. Why wouldn't I just go really big and make it 10 million in the second year? And uh, and so I had no idea how I would do that, but uh, um, that was my goal. And shy, just shy of one week of the second year, we hit 10 million in sales. And, and how that happened is I got a licensing deal and knocked myself off at every price point. Wow, that's yeah. unbelievable. And uh, let me guess, it was also on QVC. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> that was the ultimate goal. Yeah. Were you sell? Were you the? Were what do you? It's were you the one on there selling it? Yeah. It, whenever, yeah. whenever the person that owns the company or created the product can sell, it's always the best sell. It's it's a true 
true um hey how are you, you, know, you? do you know dragon you. hey oh that's my boy right there i love Great. Dragon. i love that yeah Great shout out. Um, yeah. So when you can go on air and tell your own story, it's it's more authentic. It's resonating yeah. with the audience a lot more. So that's really the ideal situation. But there's a lot of founders of companies and products that are scared to death to do that and will never do it, or they live far away. Yeah. And they don't. And I'm you know so close to QVC, so that was easy for me. Um, but yeah, it was it was a goal. What I did though strategically. I think it's important to share this for anyone who's aspiring to do something like this. Yeah. Uh, the amount of money, a product that you need to have in the warehouse that, at QVC or HSN or any of those um, outlets are is a lot. And uh, sometimes it could be in the warehouse for months before you actually get booked to be on air with it. So there's a huge financial risk that goes along with it. So. I watched a lot of companies as a spokesperson struggle because of that or lose everything because of it. So I waited intentionally until I had the licensing deal to do it, to bring it onto QVC because then somebody else is funding that and taking that bigger chunk of financial risk. Um, and thank God I did it because we had, I eventually also uh, invented technology in luggage. And at one point when the luggage was going on air, we waited for about six months, literally six months. And I kept thinking, man, if I was holding on to that capital, I would be freaking out right now. Yeah, big time. Wow. <laughs> that is unbelievable. Thanks. So like that is absolutely like that's what that's that that's what that's the American dream. <laughs> Not just for women. I'm sorry. That's for everybody. Like oh. Yeah. And, I, and and I I I you know I want to make a point about something that that helped you a lot and that is you had already way before the the handbag idea you had faced the demons of being on TV. You were on QVC already and 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 went through the jitters and and yeah. like then it was probably like well this is old hat now like yeah, I mean, it was still a little bit more vulnerable when it's your own product because it's like your baby, right? You don't want to feel rejected. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what I did, and I think since so many of you are entrepreneurs listening, what I also did was I invested a lot of, prior to the QVC, right before the QVC, as a spokesperson, I hired a, a media coach to really train me to speak in sound bites and to understand how to thrive in that environment. And, and so when I was launching the Butler Red Company, one of my biggest strategies was to become a business contributor to the media, not just to talk about my product, but to really talk about business and entrepreneurship and, and the lifestyle around it. Yeah. So that was a huge part of, of the success as well, was really understanding how then the media worked and, um, and how to not just go on and want to talk about my product, but how to actually lift up the conversation around entrepreneurship as a whole. So the big idea with Donnie Deutsch was, was big back then. And I became a contributor on there and, and, wow. and, and that kind of really carved out or unfolded another layer of, of my future and all the things that I started to, to do and, and other businesses I started to get involved in. That's such a great show, by the way. I know. Such a great show. I know. So, I was so sad when it, when it got canceled. And it was the most ludicrous, uh, ludicrous reason why. And it was 2009, and the economy started to, to tank. And a new executive at NBC came in and basically said, nobody wants these bragging inspiration shows now. And I was like, no, they need these now. Yeah. Like, about everybody needs this people are getting unemployed they might want to start businesses and it was just complete insanity i was so upset when it was when it was over but um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what are some of the other you you've done more more television stuff than than that yes i am um, basically just became a contributor to all the major networks um wow. literally every one of them abc nbc cbs um fox uh fox business um, a lot of the other uh, smaller networks that got gobbled up by now. Um, but 
business and lifestyle is always my focus. Uh, there was also a show on Fox News called Strategy Room, um, which was really about business mm -hmm. strategy. We'd bring on entrepreneurs all the time and, and authors and speakers. And uh, so it was not a political show at all. It was flat out a business strategy show. So um, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, in the last few years, I kind of uh, backed out of it a little bit. Uh, things, first of all, it, it ha have changed um, in that world. Yeah. But but also, um, you know, my girls started getting older and I started to realize, oh, my gosh, I'm going to blink my eyes and they're going to be in college. And I don't want to miss out on this time. And when I was when my girls were younger, I had a client that was, was very wise. And when I had them, I said, I don't know, should I take some time off? Should I? I don't know what to do with my career right now. I feel so overwhelmed. And she said, oh, no. Now is the time that you need to kick butt because when they're in middle school and high school is when they need you the most. Bigger kids, bigger problems. And that was such incredible advice that I never had thought of back then. And uh, and so that's kind of what I did. Uh, my girls are sophomores now and, and literally in a blink of eye, two years, they're gonna be off in college. So uh, I decided to dial back that part of my commitments uh, the last few years to actually be more present. Uh, and then in two years, I can spread my wings again to the level of which I desire. But, um, you know, everything happened so fast back then and the snowball effect happened and I started creating other products and companies and partnering with other ones and going on air is an incredible commitment. Just one segment can be one segment that's eight minutes could be like three hours of your life. So wow, you are, literally. Uh, so um, so yeah. So so it's been an interesting uh, transition. Uh, I'd say the last few years was more focused on just the speaking engagements uh, and and writing this the book that's launching right now. Um, and so, like I said, in the next two years, I'll figure out maybe I'll go back in that direction some way. But um, it's I I want to I want to point out that you know we hear these things that through through tragedy through pain in fact the subtitle of my book is turning pain into profit right so yeah. so like you know through these moments of two babies on the floor in their car seats dumping the the bag out on the on the <laughs> conveyor but I can see all this right like I'm like and, and you're in that moment, you went, there's something, and, and most people just scream and complain and, and, and don't really think, what can I do about it? What if, and I had a guy on the show the other day that that was his big thing. He started so many businesses and millions of dollars and, and it's always, well, what if I could do something about this problem and solve it? And yeah. I love the way that you did that. I love it. And it sounds like that's your approach to, to most things. So that was the name of my first book. What if, and why not? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I gotta get your book. Sorry. Well, that's how I navigate the world. What if, I mean, I question everything and that might be annoying to people, but I don't believe things just because I hear them. I question everything and Hey Larry, um, you know, I had this mentor when I was in my 20s, in my late 20s, and, and he taught me this. For one year, one year, this was such a crazy social experiment. I, I literally almost drove me crazy by the end of it. But for one year, I had to question everything. It's even the simplest things. Why is a fork a fork? Why is a chair a chair? How could a chair be built differently? How could a fork be done different? Like literally questioning everything. But it was such an incredible exercise because what it did is it showed me not everything is as it is, nor does it need to stay as it is, right? Mm. So, so that definitely led to my mindset of sticking a dishwasher tray into a handbag, right? So um, really understanding to question everything, what if, allows us to get to a greater space of possibility. And the reason the book title was What If and Why Not was because uh, when I was launching the Butler Bag Company, I was going to different companies in New York City in the fashion industry, showing my idea, pitching my idea, trying to get people to buy into the idea. And, and over and over and over again, uh, there would be people that would say to me, um, women don't want that. Now, no offense, guys, at all, but it was all men that were telling me women don't want that. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like, 
oh, that makes sense. I want it. Why would you say that? Like my friends <laughs> want it. So, um, oh. you know, I, I realized something very interesting psychologically that was happening. Every time they'd say women don't want it, I'd get defensive and I defend my idea, which only leads somebody else to defend their idea. Yeah. So this walls and barriers come up because now we're both trying to just defend our, our being right. And the last meeting I was going into, I thought I've got to change the, the narrative here. I need to change my approach. And, and I thought of how survivor was created and, and how that everybody in the television industry kept saying that uh, no one wanted that kind of show and, and, and how, uh, all of a sudden, it now changes the face of television. And so I, I had to get people to see possibility. And um, and so in the last meeting that I went to, same kind of thing, women don't want that, we've tried that already. And instead of defending my idea, I sat there and I said, what if, what if, just entertain my crazy thought for a second, what if women do want it? And what if it just wasn't done right? And what if there wasn't the right voice around it? And what if it wasn't the right time? Mm. What if your competitor says yes and you say no and it changes the entire fashion or handbag industry? Then how are you gonna feel? Wow. And that was the tipping point for that, type, that time frame, those conversations, because then all of a sudden I got him to see possibility. I got him to see competitiveness. So right. that, that man then became my business partner in this venture. Brilliant. So brilliant. That, that posing that question, what if, is so powerful because it gets people to see possibility. Uh, it helps open people's minds because we're seeing it right now on social media and all the craziness that's going on in this world right now. So many people are trying to position their, their beliefs and then other people are trying to fight those beliefs. And it's literally just this like nonsense of people fighting back and forth without actually thinking about the other perspective. Yeah. And the true the truth is we have to get people to see the other perspective. Well, it's, all, it's and 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 it's always always a good thing when men say that's not what women want. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's always this, I mean, I find I found it so funny. I was like, wait, you're not a woman. What are you talking about? What what our industry is controlled making decisions for women by men? Again, no offense, but I found it really crazy. <laughs> that is that's insane. It is. So so let me ask you a question. Normally this is an hour long, but we're a little over and that's okay. I don't care. It's the internet and it's my show. We can go all day if we want. Break the so, rule. <clears throat> so what do you think? And I want to talk about your book. In fact, I have something to pop up on the screen here in a minute. But um, what do you think? And and I, let me preface this by saying the number one answer is always fear. And, and it makes sense. You'll understand. What do you think holds most people back in life from? And, and I don't mean I'm talking like maybe somebody that's had a job for 20 years, but they, they want to write that cookbook or they want to, um, and I hope my mother-in-law is watching, they want to write that cookbook um, or they want to, and, and all of the, the, the things that stop them, that prevent them from doing it. What do you think that that is? So I'll give you a different answer than fear since everyone kind of knows that answer. Yeah. Uh, my belief is people just not knowing what they don't know. They don't know what they don't know, so they don't know how to get that information, mm. or they don't even know how to seek that information, or they don't even know that the possibility exists. Or uh, in that, they don't believe that they're actually worthy or capable. And uh, somebody actually commented earlier when we talked about this, about the conversation about not feeling deserving of. So um, that's that's part of not knowing what you don't know. Never explore, exploring your own sense of worth and, and deservingness. Uh, and so I started going through life instead of saying, why me? Why not me? Why not me? Somebody's going to do it. Why not it be me? Uh, and so, um, so much of what I teach is trying to people teach people to know what they don't know, to have resources, to have a toolbox of, of being able to build a house instead of just say somebody else needs to build that house. Uh, and so I, I, 
I think that so often people think it's not for them, it's for everybody else, that they don't deserve it, or they just don't know what's possible, so they don't even try to, to access it. I love that. Love that answer. Along the way, did you experience any moments where you were just like, I, 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 I can't buy food for the kids, the, the electric bills late, the... Did you experience any times where it was really, really rough financially? That was more my childhood. My, was my, it? my childhood was like that. So yeah. um, when I caught my dad cheating on my mom uh, going oh. into ninth grade, uh, my Jeez. dad left and uh, left $400 on the table and left. And, and it was all control and manipulation. My entire childhood around money was control and manipulation. Wow. Right, a lot of money reprogramming that I had to do. Yeah. Um, and so to to hurt my mom, my dad essentially was hurting us because he wasn't paying the electric bills, he wasn't paying the mortgage, he wasn't paying our tuition. I couldn't go to my sophomore dance. So my mom would literally gather change in a bag and go to the grocery store and cry that she couldn't buy us like we wanted Oreos or something. Yeah. Wow. So I know that feeling very well. Yeah. And, and there's definitely been times where, uh, you know, I caught business partner, the one I talked about earlier, cheating up, cheating, stealing um, from me. Uh, that oh. definitely put us into a bad position in the business. Um, and, and so there's definitely been times where I'm like, bruh, I got to figure this out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I believe in my, Resiliency though, uh, and going back to beliefs, the biggest belief you have to, to really gain uh, strength in is the belief in yourself. Yeah. And so when things happen, um, like even right now, I mean, I had 40 speaking engagements and uh, book signings canceled between March 15th and June. Now I have another 65 lined up for the rest of the year that are all probably gonna be canceled too. If not, maybe a few will still exist. So I've tried to get many of them to turn into um, many of them to turn into virtual events, um, but that was for this year a huge chunk of my predicted income. There was contract yeah. signed for all of these different events, uh, but the ones that are so far out, there's no financial obligation. Of course, what's happening in the world is not in their control, right? So right. I'm in a position right now. I need to figure out how to adapt to what's happening right now to make up for what that predicted revenue was. So um, so it happens all the time throughout being an entrepreneur where there's moments that are working for you and then there's moments that just aren't working for you. And yeah. those moments that aren't working for you um, are ones that you definitely want to um, tap into your resiliency. Like any entrepreneur that's a real entrepreneur has to pride themselves on being resilient and figuring it out and looking at things as opportunities. So I see right now, I could be stuck in my anger, disappointment, my my entire book tour got canceled. Um, I was in Asia, touring all over, doing all these great things, just kicking it off in February and the beginning of March and then all of a sudden it comes to a screeching hop. So I could be mad or I could say, how do I adapt and how do I make the most of this? So one of my thought processes through this is, Every crisis, human behavior changes. Every crisis creates an opportunity of new innovation for the future. When you identify that human behavior is changing, you start to watch the behavioral changes before it is, is obvious, before it's this trend that's in everybody's faces. Like it's too late to make masks now. It's too late right. to get in on that whole uh, PPE whole game, right? Yeah. But what's next what's happening next for people and so that's really where my focus is and and one of the biggest things i've identified like you doing this for so long i've been teaching virtual classes for 10 years now before yeah. most people were but there was a ton of resistance still from companies to do virtual trainings so they'd still want me there in person which i totally get i, I like human connection too but a lot of companies are now becoming more comfortable with it. So that provides that opportunity of openness. Yep. Uh, there's also an opportunity of, um, you know, people doing more online courses than, than ever before. Uh, yep. 
there's opportunity that's coming with these new behavioral changes and that's what we all need to focus on instead of what went wrong because i see what went wrong now how do i fix it to make it right that's, that's so true and yeah. and they're definitely open now i mean they they don't have a choice yeah you don't have a choice yeah. so you can either yeah. stay focused on what's wrong or focus on what's right and, and and adapt to that. What the question I always ask is, what value do I have to add to this situation? Yeah, that's really what it comes down to because that's where people win is when they can add value to a situation or a circumstance. I want to I want to pop your book up here on the on the I have your your what do you call it a one sheet here? Yeah, there you go. I love you it. You can peek around, <laughs> peek around it. <laughs> so the more method is your new book. And I'm going to pop a, um, a banner up here. Great. Uh, you can go to changeherstory.org forward slash products forward slash right there. The oh, dash yeah. more dash method. Yeah, it'll be on uh, Amazon any day now. Amazon got really um, behind, I guess is the right word to say, yeah. uh, during this whole crisis because they stopped actually all... Uh, receiving all shipments from non-essentials yeah. uh, and, and rolling out all new books uh, during that time period. So they're trying to catch up right now. So any day we'll see it pop up. It's actually there. There's the page there. The book's just not for sale on, on Amazon yet. But uh, my publisher uh, is the first ever nonprofit publisher uh, with a mission. And the mission is, the reason it's called Change Your Story is it's, for every author in uh, that's being published through this publishing house is a woman who's been through um, some obstacles that they've overcome the obstacles and they're um, adding value to the world because of those obstacles. So turn their pain into their purpose. You said to pain into profit. So yeah. turn their pain into purpose. And uh, so it's a, it's a really, um, I feel good about being part of this publishing company that's not just publishing books, but publishing for a mission as well. I, I, I love your story. I love what you're doing. What do you feel is, is, is coming down the road for you now? I mean, obviously this is a big shift that's occurring. Yeah. Uh, so interestingly enough in 2009, 2010, I was doing a ton of, um, business stories, um, on TV and, and magazines about how to start your own business. And, um, many of those, uh, businesses were more about consulting and freelancing. Uh, and so there were a lot of people that were laid off like now that, uh, had great skill sets, skill sets that companies still needed, but couldn't afford the risk or, or just couldn't afford to keep them on as an employee. So I would teach all these people how to, uh, really package themselves as, as consultants, uh, and be able to freelance, to all of these different companies, including the company that usually fired them, will actually hire them back as a consultant, maybe 20 hours uh, a week. And so the company still needs the skill sets. Uh, they just don't want the overhead or the risk because it's not just your salary, it's all the benefits that go along with it as well that, that creates the risk. And so um, this became a win-win for everybody. The company still needed the skill sets, the people had the skill sets and they could provide it to the company, still make money, usually, they make more money as consultants. Most often you make more money as a consultant. Yep. So they would then not just work for the company that they did work for, but other companies in the industry, making more money, working less hours uh, and having more time freedom. So um, Jumpstart has evolved since then. The company that I created around this concept was Jumpstart Connect and it's evolved since then. But right now what I'm doing is getting back to the the focus of how it started and creating more programs uh, and trainings for people to do this again. Uh, so I call it from unemployed to self-employed, teaching people how to step-by-step -step go through a process of packaging themselves as consultants, uh, how to market themselves, how to have these conversations, how to think like an entrepreneur, bringing in uh, experts, you know, accountants, teaching them if they've never, had a home-based business before, all the different tax incentives and write-offs that come along with that. Uh, and, and to really uh, feel empowered during this time period instead of feeling disempowered. Uh, and, and so that's one of the biggest things that I'm I'm focusing on right now. Obviously my book, my virtual book tour. Uh, yeah. 
is another right. thing that I'm doing. Uh, and yeah. any of anyone on here that are moms, I'm actually doing since Mother's Day is this weekend, uh, and moms who are trying to work from home and homeschool kids at the same time are feeling a, a bit maxed out right now. So uh, tomorrow at one o'clock, I'm doing a training on my web page. You can find it. Uh, the more method training for moms uh, to gain gain a little bit more sanity and a semblance during this time period. What's so, your web page? What's your website? JenGruber.com? It's uh, I'm sorry, it's on my Facebook page. It's just mine. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, and um, and so you can find it there. I just posted it. It's on my wall. Maybe two down, two or three things down, and you can just click that you're going, and and I'll be updating in there. But uh, you know, those are two of the biggest yeah. things that I'm focused on right now. That that's so awesome. Uh, you know, I um, I love what you're doing. I love I I I, I love it. And the more, the more method is that that's not just for women, right? Oh gosh, no, Hold on. I, I was just going to clarify that the more method yeah. is for everybody, the more Good. method is about performance. Um, really it's about how to be your best version self It's about expanding your potential to beyond what you thought was possible. So I speak all over at, you know, financial planning companies, insurance companies, every industry I speak to men and women. Um, and, and basically, the more method is the culmination of my 20 plus years of teaching human potential, bringing multiple disciplines together yeah. so that people can holistically build their best version self. So it's psychology, emotional intelligence, which is a component of psychology, uh, physiology, nutrition, quantum physics, metaphysics, and neuroscience all rolled up into one. Uh, the more method is an acronym, um, teaching people how to truly optimize who they are. The reason I said for tomorrow for the moms is just doing something that, um, you know, kind of acknowledges that Mother's Day is coming and many moms aren't going to be going to a spa and getting a treatment or escaping uh, into some me quiet time. So I wanted to give that to them. But this is for anyone, literally created for anyone at any stage of life to take them from where they are to where they want to go. What is the, what you said, the more method is the, it's an acronym Yeah. for what? So the methodology is an acronym. Uh, oh. and, and so I'll break it down real quick for you. I know we're, we're going over, but yeah. uh, M stands for mindfulness and all that you do. So in order to get more of everything you desire in life, you must first become more mindful of all aspects of your life. So I actually created an auditing system for people to mindfully audit their lives to figure out what's working and what's not working. Yeah. Uh, and then O is the optimization of body and brain, teaching people how to optimize uh, their physiological state to optimize their mental and emotional state. This is what I call time hacking. Uh, we actually can leverage time and, and create more time in our life when we optimize our bodies and brains. Uh, the R is uh, learning how to be responsive versus reactive. So this is big time the emotional intelligence focus yeah. where I teach people how to respond to life and not react to life. I teach them how to, uh, what I call these mindset shifts that I created that take them to, from a negative place to a positive place, teaching them really things like nothing has meaning until you give it meaning. So if nothing has meaning until you give it meaning, you're the meaning maker of your life. So now you can go back and rewrite every story that's holding you back mm. because you gave it that meaning. And so if that story is holding you back, change the meaning, change your life. And, um, and then the E is excelling in all aspects of life where uh, I, I talk about holistic success. In order to get more of everything we desire in life, we have to look at our lives holistically in our approach to success, not just being successful in an achievement professional way, but successful in our relationships, successful in our health and well-being, and successful in our own personal evolution. And that's where we find harmony and equanimity is is being holistically success. But if we only focus on one or two of those categories, we find ourselves in a place of imbalance. My <clears throat> my wife put Thank it you. all up there. <laughs> I, love <that. laughs> I love it. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> she, she's more than likely going to be in your thing tomorrow. So oh, I love um, that. That'd be amazing. Jen, thank you so much. I know we went over the time, but thank you. I, I'm so grateful that you came on and, and shared all of your wisdom. And everybody needs to go grab a copy of her book right now. The address is scrolling across the bottom.
if somebody would be so kind as to just type all that out and drop it in the comments, that would be awesome. <laughs> hint, hint, Jill. <laughs> she, Jill. she will. But um, anyway, Jen, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on and, and telling your story and sharing your wisdom. Thank you. I'm so grateful for you having me. I'm grateful for Joe for introducing us and yeah. grateful for everyone listening and commenting. I saw your comment. Sometimes I was talking, so I couldn't comment back, but thank you so much. Uh, and I look forward to connecting with many of you through social media from here on. Yeah. Awesome. Don't hang up on me. I am going to end the live stream though. So thank you all. Thank, thank you to you. everyone who shared this out too. Y'all rock. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jen. Thank you.